Okay, so good morning again to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we will be speaking about the impact and implications of the coronavirus pandemic on trust pricing models of multinational. And uh, for doing so, uh, we invited our experts from our transfer pricing team, Hans Roll, uh, head of transfer pricing Italy, and Simon Baumgartner. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I think that um, now it's time to start. So I'll leave it to Hans and um, enjoy the webinar. Many thanks, Martha, for the introduction and many thanks for the, uh, for the participants to participate. Well, uh, as Martha said, we're doing this in English as uh, we've got participants which are German speaking, Italian speaking and English speaking, but uh, you can obviously raise your question in any kind of language that you like to. So in German, Italian or English, probably not in Chinese, but the other, other languages might be fine. Um, the topic that we will be touching today is um, that we see that the COVID-19 crisis has a strong impact on economic circumstances. And what we will do is we will try to analyze uh, which are the possible consequences on transfer pricing policies of multinational groups. So um, please be aware that the transfer pricing regulations did not change due to the COVID crisis, at least not in Italy. But uh, economic circumstances did, and this has an impact on uh, the transfer pricing system of uh, your groups. And the aim of the presentation today is not to pick out one specific issue and to analyze this in very detail, but the aim is more to create a certain kind of awareness on which economic modifications have an impact also from a transfer pricing perspective. And uh, Simon and I, we've been discussing like uh, many different areas of interests which are affected by the COVID-19 crisis from a transfer pricing perspective. But finally, we decided to focus on three main topics. So uh, one issue that we see is that COVID-19 might have or has an impact on the profitability of the group, sometimes even leading to uh, loss situations uh, on a group level. Yeah? And we will uh, uh, see which impact this might have on the transfer pricing systems. A second, we also notice that our clients are thinking about modifying or are already modifying their supply chain. And also this has or can have strong impacts uh, from a transfer pricing perspective. And finally, the third point that we will be touching is that obviously uh, we see uh, that all, are, all uh, are struggling like for liquidity and this is raising the need for finance, uh, for financing. And so as a third point, we will be uh, focusing on finance issues aligned with uh, the new publication uh, of the um, OECD guidelines on this issue which will uh, then become like chapter 10 of the transfer pricing guide, uh, guidelines. And Simon uh, helped me, we discussed also other issues uh, like um, stranded workforce and yeah. what else? Yeah, so thank you Hans, a uh, warm welcome also from my side. Um, looking forward to this uh, webinar today with you. Um, yeah, so other topics that we briefly also uh, discussed that might have an impact from a transfer pricing perspective are uh, considerations around uh, stranded workforce due to companies closing their borders. There have been circumstances where um, employees have been uh, trapped in one country and have not been able to return to their workplace in another country. And this might also have implications on one hand from a transfer pricing perspective because certain functions are suddenly being performed in, another, in one country instead of another. And then also, uh, more importantly, from a permanent establishment uh, um, uh, assessment perspective. And the other topic that we also uh, had uh, briefly um, discussed uh, was uh, the topic around um, uh, controversy and tax audits that are being postponed now. 
and also if companies have entered into so-called advanced pricing agreement discussions with uh, uh, tax authorities, um, uh, the uh, considerations and assumptions taken in those advanced pricing agreement negotiations might have changed now due to the COVID-19 crisis. And this will also need to be considered once the, the discussions start uh, to uh, kick off again. Yeah, and then you also probably have impact on patent boxes and stuff like this. But but as we only have like one hour of time, we thought uh, to focus on these uh, three areas like profitability, the modification of the supply chain and finance issues. And before I will hand over to Simon, which will be treating the first issue, so the the the, 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 um, the reduced profitability of potential loss situations, I will make one general comment. Like, one very important issue is that the transfer pricing regulations did not change due to COVID-19 crisis. This means that also in like hard times like these, that the arm's length principle has to be observed. Yeah? And you also have to consider that the tax auditor normally steps in a few years later. So 2020 will be probably under audit in 2023 or 24 and something like this. This makes it even more important to observe the arm's length principle um, also during the crisis because we had a similar situation when we faced the financial crisis 2007, 2008, 2009. And what we learned is that if we tried to use the financial crisis, for example, as an argument in order to explain why a limited risk distributor had a reduced profitability, the bigger the time gap between the financial crisis and the tax audit, yeah, the less the tax auditors were willing to follow these arguments. Yeah. So um, consider that the arm's length principle is still in place and then tax audits will be taking place in a few years. And this makes it important to consider the arm's length principle also now in these special situations. So Simon, if you would like to start with the first topic. Thank you, Hans. Um, so I'm going to kick off our in-depth discussion uh, with the first area that we have identified as being important for you as an audience, which concerns uh, um, uh, the current uh, loss uh, or uh, decreases in profitability and uh, often also loss situations that companies are incur incurring and how they might impact uh, the transfer pricing policies set in place by the groups. So as mentioned, companies nowadays due to this crisis experience significant drops in revenues because they are not able to sell certain products anymore or need to shut down plants. And as a result, potentially end up even in a loss position on an overall group level. And those loss making entities and groups realize now that their uh, transfer pricing models have been designed for times of economic prosperity but are not really adapted for times of crisis. And uh, this is uh, especially uh, the case for companies and groups that have put in place so-called uh, entrepreneurial or principal models, where you have on one hand uh, the entrepreneurial entity, which is uh, the key strategic entity of the group and is uh, based on the transfer pricing model entitled to all the residual returns arising from the value chain. And on the other hand, you have so-called limited risk entities, um, which are only uh, performing uh, limited functions and uh, assuming limited risks and are thus entitled only to a low but stable uh, profit in line with their uh, limited risk profile. And such entities are, for example, entities uh, that we encounter quite uh, regularly are, for example, uh, limited risk distribution entities uh, on the distribution side uh, or commissionaire models also and on the manufacturing and service side we also have those kind of entities which are for example the contract manufacturing or tall manufacturing entities or the service providers. Um, the expectation for the routine entities would be to earn a small but stable profit and the question now is whether it is entitled or should be entitled to this uh, stable profit margin also during this time of unprecedented crisis. Um, there are of course two opposing views with regard to this uh, question. On one hand you have the view of the tax authorities in the countries where those limited risk entities are located which are 
probably or most likely of the view that those companies also in times of economic pr prosperity are earning only a small profit. So they should still, since their functional profile has uh, probably not changed, they, change, they st should still uh, continue to earn this small uh, profit margin. On the other hand, you have the view of the group as a whole, which is now loss making and loss and, 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 and would like to therefore decrease the profitability of the limited risk entity as losses on an overall group level and profits in the uh, subsidiaries would lead uh, to uh, impacts from both uh, 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 a liquidity perspective as well as, uh, from, uh, as, well as drive up the, the, the effective tax rate of the group. So uh, what could companies now do uh, to assess whether adjustments to those profitabilities would be appropriate or not? So there is no clear cut answer, but there are a couple of questions that companies might, and you as an audience might start asking yourself. So a first question is maybe, how is the current DP policy structured? Does it, uh, and also the intercompany agreements, do they allow for loss sharing uh, between the companies or should the principal, the entrepreneurial entity bear all the losses arising from this crisis, given that it earns also the residual profits in times of prosperity? Then another question is also whether the target profit margins that the limited risk entities can be, or that the limited risk entities are earning can be lowered. And uh, this could potentially be achieved by so-called comparability adjustments. Typically, the results earned by those entities are determined via database studies and searches and benchmark studies. And the question is whether uh, there could be adjustments applied to those studies. So we will discuss this topic in more detail on the next slide. Um, lastly, a, 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 a third and, and, and also important question that companies should bear in mind is regardless which adjustments and changes you put in place, please also consider the impact that those changes have also on other uh, tax topics such as withholding tax, VAT or customs issues. Given, given those, those questions, um, what are potential action items that, that you as an audience could put in place to assess whether an adjustment is warranted? So first and foremost, as already mentioned, you should revisit your contractual arrangements. Third parties are currently reviewing and renegotiating their contractual arrangements. So this is also something that you should consider doing on an intercompany level. In order to do that, you would need to check for clauses in the intercompany arrangements that allow for renegotiating them. So check if there are any financial hardship or force majeure clauses that would allow you to renegotiate the contract. Once the contractual basis is determined, analyze in detail the contact of the parties. Who is effectively bearing the risk and controlling the risk that is arising as a result of this crisis? And should this also be the, the company responsible for bearing the majority of the losses? In this regard, you might consider using the OECD six-step risk analysis framework, which helps you via a detailed step plan to go through the different steps that could help you analyze what risks are borne by what entity. And lastly, once you have uh, performed those steps based on the analysis performed, revisit your TP models and TP policies and change them accordingly. Consider also changing or potentially suspending the intercompany agreements, for example, by implementing memorandums of understanding that state that the current inter that the intercompany agreements are not valid and different terms apply during this time of crisis. Okay, so moving on after having given you a framework on, on the more generic uh, um, steps you could undertake, let's now uh, do a more uh, in-depth uh, dive into the, the, the potential comparability adjustments that you could apply. As mentioned, the results of limited risk companies are typically determined through benchmark studies and database analysis. The data used in those studies is typically from two, three or more years ago and does not reflect the current economic uh, and operational situation in which uh, we are during this crisis. 
Uh, furthermore, benchmarks are also typically one-sided analysis. They only look at one side of the transaction and don't really consider the overall profitability of the group and what would happen if a loss is achieved on an overall group level. Lastly, uh, the functional profile of the entities that are being benchmarked might also have changed during the COVID-19 crisis. May potentially, for example, because it is incurring additional risks, uh, market or credit risks now, or because there are certain functions that have been shifted and are now being carried out in this set entity. Um, on, on this topic, Hans will talk to you uh, in more detail uh, later, on, later on. But uh, nevertheless, all those instances and issues might uh, warrant an adjustment of the currently applied transfer prices and thus also an adjustment of the profit margins achieved by the uh, um, limited risk entities. Again, the key question an entity should pose itself uh, in this regard is, are the current benchmarking analysis aligned with the COVID environment? If the answer is no, what are TP solutions uh, in or, uh, that could allow companies to adjust those results and the benchmarks and change the target profit margins? And lastly, uh, when is the time for doing those adjustments? Should they be done now uh, as soon as possible or should you wait until later when, for example, the year is uh, finished and you have a better picture, picture what the company has earned on an overall annual basis and then adjust through a so-called year-end adjustment. Again, it really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no one fits all solution. However, a, a couple of uh, key action points that uh, you as an audience might want to consider is, uh, if you consider performing comparability adjustments, try to look for real life third party examples if available. Maybe you have, for example, also third party agents and you have a decrease in sales to the, uh, achieved by those third party agents and you could use those third party results as a proxy for your intercompany pricing. Or if those are not available, you might consider adjusting your existing benchmarks to quantify profitability decreases in the time of crisis. And you could do this potentially through statistical regression analysis by looking, for example, at how the results of comparables have changed in other times of crisis. For example, the 2007-2008 financial crisis and use those uh, um, results and experience values to adjust the prices in this current time of crisis. Another potential um, option could also be to adapt your uh, search strategy and your set of comparable companies to create subsets which are more heavily impacted by the COVID-19 crisis and simulate the results of those subsets over time in different economic cycles. For example, again, looking at the economic crisis. Lastly, you might also want to consider using macro, make macro data that is being published by governmental and international intergovernmental bodies such as the OECD. Such data is, for example, the um, Business Climate Index and uh, try to use potentially decreases in those indexes and through, again, statistical analysis, try to reflect the impact of those uh, um, um, decreases also on the results of your comparable companies. Regardless on what solution you decide to choose, uh, it is really important and it is advised that you start documenting the comparability adjustments as soon as you put them in place in order to um, robustly and properly support the change of the TB policy. We have experienced also in the time of the financial crisis that ex ante analysis as soon as the changes are put in place are way more robust. They mirror what third parties are doing and they are way more robust than um, documentation and analysis uh, ex post once the TP audit has already started. When you do those documentation, consider also documenting so-called um, situations or trigger events that would make the TP policy go back to normal. I don't know, once a certain revenue level is again reached, maybe the situation would go back to normal, the comparability adjustments would not apply anymore. And lastly, I 
very briefly also want to touch base on another item and element that might influence the results of uh, the risk, limited risk entities as a consequence of the crisis. And those are so-called extraordinary one-time expenses due to the COVID-19 crisis, such as, for example, plant shutdown costs. Maybe companies need to shut down plants. This uh, uh, leads to additional costs or supply chain disruption costs, or also maybe inventory obsolescence costs. Maybe due to the crisis, you're not able to sell your inventory as quickly as possible. It's remaining in the warehouses for a longer period of time, and some of it might become obsolete. Those uh, expenses are typically unforeseen and not provisioned, and are also uh, issues in times of economic uh, prosperity, even more so in times of crisis, it's always difficult uh, how to allocate those. There is usually no clear predefined policy and the question is who should bear them? Is it the entrepreneurial principal entity or the limited risk entity? Again, in order to be able to assess better uh, this uh, question, uh, look at the contractual arrangements and the TP documentation that you have in place to see whether there are some indications on who should be bearing them. Check also, based on, on, on those documentation, check then also the actual conduct of the parties. Who is typically controlling the decisions for bearing and, and uh, for, for, for incurring those costs? Based on this analysis, determine then a reasonable and defendable allocation of the extraordinary expenses and document it in a timely and robust manner. This should help you um, uh, in, uh, and go a long way in case you will encounter a tax audit on those items a few years down the line. Um, so with this, I would like to conclude uh, on this topic and would, with the following takeaways concerning losses on a group level and how you could potentially deal with them from a TP policy perspective. Be proactive, consider and making changes and make changes already now rather than waiting uh, uh, too long and wait until uh, TP audits are uh, uh, um, uh, at your doorsteps. Start with the intercompany agreements and the documentation that you have put in place. And based on that, then move on to examine the actual conduct of the party to derive a course of action. There are a number of ways of potentially adjust the, uh, the, the, the prices, uh, make use of them. And lastly, make sure to document what you have done as well as the rationale of the change in order to be prepared in case of a tax audit. With, with this, I would uh, like to conclude this first area of interest and would like to hand over to Hans, who will be talking in more detail about uh, uh, changes and disruption of supply chain and business restructurings caused by the crisis and how they might impact uh, your transfer pricing systems. Thank you, Simon. Can you switch to the next slide, please? Yeah. Thanks. So, so the, 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 the second area where we see major impacts from a transfer pricing perspective is uh, modifications on the supply chain. We see that our clients, like some of them are thinking about and the others are already implementing changes uh, to the supply chain. And they're all driven by operational needs. So it's not, it's not like, uh, aggressive tax planning or something like this. There can be different reasons why uh, our clients are thinking about or are modifying supply chains. It's, it's sometimes because of their like bringing back home strategic uh, activities like production or R&D activities. Then um, they're thinking about diversifying their production activities like splitting it up and spreading it over uh, different countries where different legal entity reside. Uh, some of them have been forced to reduce uh, their production level or to shut down completely and to shift certain production activities to an affiliated company located abroad. Uh, others instead are um, thinking about acquiring suppliers which supply strategic raw materials, intermediate, semi-finished goods or something like this. Other companies, companies instead are switching from a third party supplier uh, to an intercompany supplier. 
and other uh, companies um, are trying to benefit from the crisis by, by enlarging their, their product spectrum and to introduce uh, new products which might be uh, promising. So there are many different reasons, operational region, uh, reasons why this COVID-19 crisis has an impact on the supply chain. And this then in turn has also an impact on, uh, from a transfer pricing perspective. And there we see two major uh, areas. Yeah. So one area is so-called business structuring, which is uh, chapter nine of the actual OECD guidelines. And the other impact is on the transfer pricing policies uh, as a whole. So to, to start with the first issue, business restructurings, Business restructurings have always to do with the transfer of something of value cross-border between two affiliated entities. Yeah? For example, uh, pharmaceutical industry is thinking about uh, closing production uh, entities in the Asian region, region and bringing them back home to the country where the headquarter resides. Well, this obviously also has a transfer pricing impact uh, because the manufacturing company, especially if it's a full-blown manufacturing company, definitely has some intangible assets, yeah, like access to, to important suppliers, production know-how, maybe also patents. Yeah? And so now this package is going to be transferred to the uh, com uh, country where the parent company resides or the acquiring company resides. And this triggers what? This normally triggers so-called exit payments. And exit payments are generally related with uh, a very high level of risk because, uh, because in order to detect the transfer price related to these exit payments, you normally have to, have to do valuations. And as we all know, valuations are related to a very high degrees of freedom. And, and if you do a valuation or if the tax auditor does a valuation, it's quite simple just by modifying few assumptions to come to uh, very significant differences in the values which have to be attributed to these uh, functions uh, which have been transferred. So, um, and for that reason, we believe that, that the most important thing with changes in the supply chain side is that you are aware that this also has an impact from a transfer pricing perspective. So they are obviously due to operational reasons, but the impact on a transfer pricing, uh, from a transfer pricing perspective might be huge. So the most important thing is that, that you are able to detect them because only if you see them, you can react. Uh, react in which way? Well, in some cases, uh, when you do like smart um, transfer pricing modeling, you might be able to avoid uh, to have to execute these exit payments. Let's take, for example, the case where company A has to uh, reduce production or sh shut down production for a certain period of time, and they're shifting it to an affiliated entity located in another country. Yeah. Well, you can probably avoid the need to uh, install an exit payment by the way that the company which is shifting the production to another company is still invoicing the customer and remunerates the other production entity uh, like a contract manufacturer based on a cost plus model. So just, just, just as an example, if you cannot avoid exit payments, uh, our hint is to perform uh, valuation as it needs to be done and obviously to document it uh, in a timely manner. So uh, detect business restructurings and react in a proper way, either by avoiding them or by performing a proper valuation. But then after the restructuring has happened, you might have to consider that the environment or the, the value chain or how function and risks along the value chain are allocated within your multinational group. Have, this has been affected by the restructuring activities. So after the restructuring has taken place, an additional to do on your side is to review if the transfer pricing policies that you have in place and especially the underlying functional profile of the companies is still the same. And if not, to modify the transfer pricing policies. Let's make another example in this regard. Let's uh, assume that you're a distribution company 
and that you uh, in the past or bef uh, in, the, in the period uh, before the COVID crisis, you were purchasing your products or your services or whatever from a fully fledged distributor. Yeah? So the entrepreneurial part was the counterpart to the transactions you have been characterized as a limited risk distribution entity. And the transfer pricing system was set up in a way that the distribution entity was left with the target margin, like the example that Simon did before, and the residual profit has been transferred through the transfer price to the acquisition of the goods to the fully full-blown full manufacturing entity. So if now restructuring activities take place, for example, if the headquarter decides to centralize strategic R&D and manufacturing functions, which first have been with your provider, but now are being relocated to the headquarter, uh, this means that your counterpart to the transaction might be reduced from a fully fledged manufacturing company to a contract manufacturer, leading to the result that this company is no longer entitled to the residual profit, but probably to a cost plus remuneration. From the perspective of the distribution entity, this means that the transfer price that you're paying in future for the acquisition of products might be lowered significantly, but there's might probably a need to install another transaction towards the company which acquired the, the strategic, uh, strategic functions and to either set up a license payment or a certain kind of service fee, which ensures that the residual profit is shifted to this third uh, company, which is now relevant when looking at, uh, at the purchase of products that you do. So, uh, be aware that also, also if, you're able, if you're handling uh, the business restructuring transaction itself the right way, it also might have a long-term impact so that also transfer pricing policies are reviewed after restructuring activities have taken place, especially the functional profile. So, and apart from business restructurings, other changes to the supply chain, they might not always lead to the need to uh, to execute or to avoid uh, exit charges, but they might also have an impact on uh, the regular transfer pricing policy in place within your group. Let's make another example. Let's say that, for example, um, still the, the distribution company tended to purchase all the products from affiliated suppliers. But now, because of uh, issues with the production capacity on the side of the supplier, they, uh, they can no longer purchase any products from group companies. And in order to not lose the relationship with, with their final customers, they can switch and at least for a limited period of time, probably buy other products, comparable products from third parties on the market in order to sell them on to their customers. Well, this obviously, as it is a third party transaction, it's in the first step not relevant from a transfer pricing perspective, but this transaction might constitute a comparable uncontrolled transaction to the purchase of products that you have done uh, until now from group companies. And so you have to observe if this comparable uncontrolled price is in line with the transfer pricing policy that, have, that has been applied uh, for, uh, to the purchases of products from affiliated companies, just to make one example. Or it can, it can also work the other way around. It can, can be that, that uh, the production company uh, was purchasing raw materials from a third party, but this third party can no longer supply them. So they're looking uh, out uh, if there is a potential so other source within, the, within the, uh, the, the, the multinational group. And they're now buying raw materials from affiliated entities. Also this leads to the fact that you have to define a transfer price, which is at arm's length, and to ensure that it probably does not deviate too much from that what you have been paying to the unrelated third party supply. So um, to conclude, as I said before, the most important thing with modifications on the supply chain, which are due to the COVID-19 crisis, they're all basically driven by operational needs. Yeah? But what we like you to take away is that these operational changes, yeah, there are, no there are no changes on the, on the TP regulations, but these, these, these operational changes might have a big impact on the transfer pricing system. And the important thing is that you have the sensibility is that you see them because only if you see them, you can react either by avoiding exit payments or by, 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 by evaluating things and that you can react, that you can set 
transfer prices which are in line with the arm's length principle and then the same comment as Simon made before and then ensure to document them in a timely uh, manner to be prepared to future uh, tax audits. So much from that perspective, Simon. Thank you, Hans. Um, so I'm going to um, talk about the last uh, important area that we've identified um, as uh, relevant for you, potentially, and this concerns the intercompany financing transactions. So one of the main issues that companies are or have been accounting once the crisis hit them was to safeguard liquidity. They put different measures in place at the beginning of the crisis, probably measures to monitor how the liquidity is moving. But then once the crisis went on, uh, it became quite um, realistic and, and clear then that there were also situations where there were uh, companies within the group in need of, 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 of fresh liquidity. And my, maybe there were companies, other companies in the group where there was a certain surplus. So there was the need to transfer liquidity. And this could be achieved in a number of different ways. There are some operational ways of doing it, for example, by transferring um, uh, certain um, um, assets or functions. But then the most uh, straightforward and most common way is probably by, uh, um, by uh, entering into new intercompany financing arrangements. And uh, so uh, this result, either by entering into new financing arrangements or by renegotiating existing financing arrangements and uh, um, uh, reach uh, a stop of, of interest payments or interest holidays on one hand, or potentially also prolonging uh, the payback periods. Um, in addition to that, the market is also heavily um, impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. So external funding arrangements are also being impacted. We've realized or we've noticed a, 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 a huge uptick already on risk premiums that have to be paid on market. So especially um, companies with lower credit ratings, uh, when they want to, um, uh, when they want to uh, borrow new money, they need to pay higher interest rates now. And also covenants of existing external funding arrangements are being breached and therefore this might also lead to renegotiations and uh, increases in the interest rates of existing um, external funding arrangements. On the other hand, you also have government intervention which might uh, have a contra contrary effect as for a certain period of time it now leads to uh, cheaper funding for certain companies. But both those, those uh, external developments are also relevant for an intercompany trans, uh, tr financial transaction perspective as they might also impact the prices of intercompany uh, financing transactions, either directly if the intercompany prices are directly um, approximated from the external funding or indirectly because intercompany prices is in most cases based on external market rates. Um, as, as, as all those developments clearly state, there is a huge impact on intercompany financing uh, uh, due to the coronavirus crisis. Uh, and the question now is, or as Hans already mentioned at the beginning, the expectation is still that the prices for new agreements that are being entered into or for existing agreements that are being re renegotiated the prices need to be uh, consistent with the arm's length principle. And in this regard, the recently published OECD financial transaction guidance should help companies assess on how they could determine an uh, intercompany price that is in line with the arm's length principle. This guidance, which forms the new chapter 10 of the OECD transfer pricing guidance, has been published at the beginning of February. It hasn't been uh, um, hasn't been super prominently in the, in, the, in the press lately due to also the COVID-19 crisis. But we think it is important to look at it in more detail as it could help companies, especially, and you as an audience, especially in terms of crisis, uh, help determine how to price new intercompany financing transactions. Even more so, we consider it important in Italy as the Italian uh, tax authorities generally consider the OECD transfer pricing guidance, guidelines as soft law and are generally or 
quite uh, regularly citing and referring to them also in text audits. So with this, I'm going to hand over to Hans, who's going to introduce you to these guidelines and uh, we'll briefly also talk about the more higher arching and general principles of it. Thank you, Simon. Well, uh, the, the, uh, as, as Simon said, uh, uh, for us, it also has been very important to, 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 to highlight the publication of these guidelines at the beginning of February, because in my opinion, they, they, they should not, not get lost, especially in Italy, uh, as, as this, this is soft law. Yeah? And as, uh, in my opinion, the new guidelines, they're like formalizing one major point. They're formalizing that uh, we need to have a broader view on any kind of intercompany financing. Yeah? Because, I mean, until now, more or less, the issue or when, when, when you were talking about intercompany financing, either in tax audits, but also when you were setting up intercompany finance agreements or, or when you did the, the transfer pricing documentation, the, it, the focus was more or less always only on the arm's length nature of the interest rate. So, but if you look at the, uh, at the guidelines, at the new guidelines, this is obviously one major topic, but this is a topic that has been, has been analyzed after different kind of an, uh, analysis have, uh, have to be performed. So the, 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 there needs to be a much broader view and different analysis that needs to be, need to be done in order to ensure that the whole arrangement, not only the interest rate, complies with the arm's length principle. So basically, the starting point will also in future always be uh, the contractual arrangement uh, that, uh, that, uh, that you have in place. But uh, the uh, analysis to be done will be broadened. Yeah? Uh, they uh, will uh, include also uh, a perspective on how, uh, what's the usual finance needs uh, within the industry that, 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 uh, where your company is located. Uh, they will look at the economic situation of the uh, legal entities involved. Uh, they will also consider what's the strategic weight of the, uh, of the company which is being funded and what's the finance strategy of the multinational enterprise as a whole. And also look at what are the alternatives uh, uh, realistically available to the borrower and the lender. Yeah. And one very important thing uh, that is clearly stated in these guidelines, and which is very helpful in Italy, is that uh, the, the guidelines states state that these analyses have to be done both on the side of the borrower and on the side of the lender. And why does this help in Italy? Well, this helps because we have this 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 high court decision, which doesn't make any sense, in my opinion, from an econo economic perspective, which says that, and also the old uh, guidelines from the 80s are, uh, are saying that the market that you have to look at when you are analyzing the arm's length nature of the company finance arrangement is the market of the lender. Yeah. So uh, apart from the fact that this doesn't make any sense from an economic perspective, these guidelines now help uh, are, uh, also because they formalized that it has to be both countries which have to be considered. So, uh, and then before, after having analyzed all these facts, which are the crucial points that uh, we have to talk about uh, within the documentation or when setting up a finance agreement. Before you start talking about the interest rate, you are also, based on this analysis, you have to consider if, it, if, if, if the, the, the money that you're lending, if, if, if this is really like, if this should be interest bearing, uh, if it's really debt, or are we talking about equity? Uh, and in order to, to answer to these questions, you probably you have to answer or the, uh, additional ones. For example, you have to look at the economic position of the uh, borrowing entity, and you have to see, now, is this entity really able to repay such a loan? Uh, and uh, obviously also the lender has to, be, uh, uh, has to be the financial instrument to, 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 to grant this loan. And then also other, other uh, issues have to be looked at. For example, is the borrower really repaying this loan? And does the agreement really contain like clauses which force him to repay certain installments within certain periods of time? Yeah? Or uh, is he never repaying this loan leading to the fact that uh, should this loan be requalified into uh, equity, which means that you're not even reaching the point where you're discussing the arm's length nature of the interest rate, but the tax auditor requalifies it into equity. And 
uh, treats the whole interest payments as being not deductible from, tech, from a tax perspective. So, um, and apart from that, from, from, from clearly delineating the transaction and saying, okay, is it equity or is it debt? You also have to ensure that the other components of the uh, finance uh, agreement comply with arm's length uh, principles. For example, the duration, the currency, uh, the repayment, um, um, uh, the repayment agreement, and so on. Uh, and, in a, and then there's another important point at which the guidelines point it's uh, that they force you to perform a functional analysis, uh, um, which is generally makes, can make a difference if the, if the, if the lender uh, is entitled to really get a market interest rate or if he's entitled to get only like a risk, uh, risk free. Uh, interest rate. And because uh, the tax authorities or OECD, is, they are pointing out the, if, if the company which is, which is borrowing, which is lending the money or um, which is granting the, the company loan, for example, if they're really performing functions like, uh, or if they have a treasury department or if they're analyzing uh, the, 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 the credit worthiness of the subsidiary, if they're managing the loan, if they're monitoring the loan, then the guidelines base are basically saying, okay, this way you more or less behaving like an independent financial institution on the market, which, get, which gets remunerated with the market interest rate. But if you're not performing any function in this regard and you're just lending out some money, then it might be that uh, the, 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 the lender is not entitled to a market interest rate, but only to a, a risk-free rate. So these are the general aspects. Uh, so by concluding or summarizing, it's that we, have to, we need to have a broader view on the finance uh, transactions that we have within the, within the multinational group. We have to ensure that also the other components of the agreement uh, are at arm's length, not only, the, not only the interest rate. We have to ensure that we're really talking about debt and not about equity. And then we need to perform such a functional risk analysis, which uh, allows charging a market interest rate and not only uh, uh, a risk-free rate. Simon. Thank you, Hans. Um, so the guidance then also provide, uh, or the guidelines then also provide some more detailed guidance on the pricing approaches for certain specified intercompany transactions. Being conscious of the time, uh, I'm gonna very briefly touch base upon two of them now, which I think are the most relevant for uh, the audience. So on one hand, we have the intercompany loans. With regard to intercompany loans, the uh, guidelines state that the preferred uh, pricing approach would be the so-called CAP approach, comparable uncontrolled pricing approach, where you uh, estimate a credit rating for the borrowing entity and based on the credit rating, you then uh, determine a, a third party uh, data through a benchmark analysis that is comparable and from that derives the price. Concerning the credit rating estimates, the um, guidelines do not provide uh, um, or uh, uh, state a, a certain uh, approach or um, a favorize a, a certain approach over another. They simply state that both the member of a group approach, which uh, use, uh, essentially use the credit rating of the group as a proxy for the borrowing entity, as well as the standalone approach, um, may be appropriate. It really depends on the case at hand. So, for example, if a company is uh, um, uh, getting a lot of intrinsic support uh, from the group and is a strategic for the group's success, group rating might be more appropriate. In other cases, standalone ratings might be more appropriate. With regard to conducting the benchmarking analysis, uh, the guidelines then state that it should be done contemporaneously. And this is especially relevant during this COVID-19 crisis where the market is extremely volatile. And as such, uh, timing of when the prices are determined is critical. Uh, there are cases, even especially for bigger loans, where we will have uh, cases where you might need to conduct an adjustment of the prices already um, after determining it because the execution is maybe a couple of weeks later. So it's not possible anymore as in the past where uh, time horizons of up to six months to a year were still considered acceptable considering that recent volatility of the market. 
Uh, another uh, topic that the guidelines touch base upon are the uh, cash pooling transactions. Again, uh, I think they are especially particularly relevant during this time of crisis because they are a relatively easy mean, mean to transfer liquidity from one entity to another. Um, the guidelines uh, state with regard to cash pooling that as Hans already mentioned in the introduction, function analysis and substance is key. Especially, for example, to assess the short-term nature of cash pools. For example, we have seen cases in the past where um, cash pools have been misused to essentially grant longer-term loans to subsidiaries at lower rates because short-term rates would apply on cash pools. And this has been heavily scrutinized by uh, tax authorities in the past and we only expect it to uh, further increase due to this new guidance by the OECD. Um, the OECD then hints at the fact that the cash pool leader should typically be considered a, 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 an entity with limited uh, functions and risk and should therefore earn only a limited return. Of course, there are cases where the cash pool leader is an economic entity that conducts more strategic activities, but the starting point based on the OECD guidance is that it should be a routine entity. I mention this because it is often in cash pooling arrangements currently not the case because the cash pool leader is very often currently earning the spread between deposit and drawdown rates and is thus earning a residual return which he might not be entitled to if he was a single service provider. Lastly, the, the, the rules also state that synergy benefits should be shared among the cash pool members and I think this is particularly relevant in this current time of crisis because we might encounter cases uh, today in the crisis where cash pool leaders might result being in, stru in a structural loss position because they maybe have to borrow new money from external um, uh, parties at a higher rate due to the fact that the rates have increased and they potentially, if the intercompany drawdown and deposit rates are then not adjusted currently, accordingly, they might end up in a loss position. And this is not in line with their routine nature. And thus the question arises, if synergy benefits are shared among members, should losses, structural losses arising from this COVID-19 crisis also be shared among the members? Um, I think those are the main considerations with regard to uh, specific uh, pricing uh, approaches for intercompany transaction. With uh, this, I uh, would like to hand back to Hans so that he can uh, um, take us through the key takeaways of today's uh, um, webinar. Well, well, as I see that, at least in my inbox, I do not have any uh, questions. No? Hopefully, because we were able to answer them all uh, during our, uh, our presentation. Uh, well, the key takeaways, uh, I will make it very short for, for as I said at the beginning, um, the aim was not to analyze anything into very much detail, but we wanted to create awareness that, 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 that this COVID-19 crisis has a strong impact on the economic circumstances. And for, from a transfer pricing perspective, it's often enough that economic circumstances vary, uh, vary or are, more, are being modified uh, and even without the modification of the transfer pricing regulations. So uh, coming back to the three topics that we touched and, and talking about uh, changes to the supply chain, the most important change in this uh, takeaway in this regard is that, that we wanted to, sense, to, to create awareness that you were able to detect that which kind of modifications of the supply chain have an impact on the transfer pricing uh, policy and how you can react on it. Uh, so this sensibility that operational modifications lead to tax implications and that, uh, that uh, you have to price the respective uh, additional transactions in line with the arm's length principle and that you have to document them uh, in a timely manner. Yeah. Similarly for uh, the aspects surrounding uh, losses or uh, decreased profitability on a group level, 
and how it impacts the TP policies uh, groups are experiencing that their TP models are not uh, designed for these times of crisis and they need to think about ways of potentially making comparability adjustments. Again, uh, in this regard, uh, groups should uh, be prepared to uh, analyze in detail their contract arrangements and their actual conduct of the parties and based on that analysis, make a decision if and how to adjust the prices and then, uh, um, and, 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 and then go from there and do that as proactively as possible. And with regard to financing transactions, uh, both new as well as existing financing transactions that will be either adapted uh, um, or also kept as is uh, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis need to be aligned with the most recent OECD guidance. Again, as mentioned previously, functional analysis and substance is key. Who is doing what? Who is bearing the main risk uh, yeah. and controlling those risks? And on, and an, overall, on an overall perspective, on an overall on perspective, like, oh, sorry, did I interrupt you? Sir? No. On an overall perspective, one underlying issue, and one issue which is relevant for all of the three topics, is the fact that keep in mind that tax audits, there's a time gap between the tax audit and the years when the transactions become relevant. For that reason, it's very important that if you're facing one of these situations, that you prepare robust documentation already now in a timely manner. And documentation does not only mean the, uh, for OECD Action 13, TP documentation or following the Italian TP documentation regulation, but that documentation also means like the backup documentation, like the valuation in case of uh, shift of supply chains and agreements that you have to set up, which document that uh, the modification or that the new transfer price or whatever has been agreed uh, by both parties, by all the parties which are part to the transaction. Yeah. yeah. With this, we would like to conclude and hand over to Marta for Q and A session. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, we can wait some seconds for our attendees to write their questions in the Q and A section. Uh, that you have uh, the bottom of your screen. Um, so we will be happy to answer your questions as said before, either in Italian, German or English. Um, so let's wait for some seconds. Then of course, um, if you want to discuss uh, um, much more in depth your uh, problems or uh, if you have some specific topic to discuss our experts are, uh, are available for um, for helping you uh, either by email or uh, in dedicated video in a calls. personal meeting no yeah not <laughs> no not personal <laughs> So this is a consequence of the coronavirus, yeah, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I don't see any questions. As I, as I, I think that, that uh, as the participants, they, they could have raised the question also during the call and there are no questions in. I think that uh, we will, um, Matthew, you said that we will circulate the presentation later on also? Yes, of course. The presentation will be available, uh, I think, uh, in a couple of days. Um, and we will enclose also the link to the webinar, so you can uh, share the link uh, with your colleagues, uh, or you can watch it again. <laughs> okay. So many thanks. So I think that, that 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 that's all from our side. I would like to thank you again for your participation, and uh, well, maybe uh, hear you later on. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank Bye. you too. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you.